Okay, let's get this started. So hi everyone, my name is Kate Matthews Bray and I'm the Associate Director of Alumni Relations here at William Patterson University. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm delighted to welcome you to the virtual tour of the Living Jazz Archives here at W. <coughs> Before we get started, I'd like to take the opportunity to acknowledge my colleague, Jenna Balani, Executive Director of Alumni Relations, who is also with us tonight. Jenna, please feel free to introduce yourself. Thanks, Kate. And hi, everyone. I just want to say a quick hello. We're so pleased to have you here tonight and uh, to provide many ways for you to stay connected to William Patterson and your alumni community. So I encourage you to take advantage of the many programs and activities that we offer, such as this and other things like our virtual book club, social events, lifelong learning opportunities, career development programs, and more. So with that, thanks again for being here. And I turn it back to Kate. Awesome. Thanks, Jenna. And uh, hello to my other colleague, Maureen O'Connor, who's with us. Maureen, if you want to just give us a wave. Yeah, one. Thank you for joining us. So uh, before we get started, I'm just going to share some details on how tonight's virtual event will work. First, upon entry, your microphones and video have been muted. We kindly ask that you please keep your microphones muted during the virtual tour. We welcome questions and want this to be an interactive session. Please feel free to type your questions in the chat box throughout the event, and we'll take some time at the end of the session to answer them. Turn up the please, please note that today's session is being recorded. It will be available on demand on our alumni YouTube channel. All right, now let's get this started. William Patterson University's Jazz Archives exists to create the strongest possible connection between the history of jazz and the students who perform and study it. The archive is designed as a teaching and presentation facilities where small groups can explore the jazz musician's life, music, performance, and performance ethic and thought process. And now it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's presenter. Dr. David Dempsey is a professor of music and the jazz studies coordinator at William Patterson University, as well as the conductor of the WP Jazz Orchestra and the curator of the Living Jazz Archives. He is a saxophonist with the Phil Woods Big Band and has performed with Clark Terry, Milt Hinton, Rufus Reid, Milgrew, Milgrew Miller, Bill Charlotte, James Williams, and Jim McNeely. He has also been featured on tours, recording CBDs uh, with New York Philharmonic, <laughs> Metropolitan Opera Orchestra, and the New Hudson and American Saxophone Quartets. Say that three times fast. Uh, now I'll turn it over to Dr. Dempsey. Thank you, uh, Kate. Yeah, Kate's background is uh, what this campus looks like in June. And if you're not in this part of the country right now, we had, you know, it was like a descending sloth from the sky for about eight hours today. So it's a total sloshy mess here. But in this archive, this is not a virtual background. This is real. And I'm sitting in the Living Jazz Archive space, which is, uh, I'd have to say something of a bit of a miracle here at uh, William Patterson. Um, and maybe uh, if it's okay by all of you, I will go to uh, a screen share and I'll just show you some photos. This is a PowerPoint, but I know you've all sat through dozens of PowerPoints where you see you know, bullet points and the person's basically saying what's on the screen this is none of that. Uh, this is fun pictures to look at, and it kind of quickly tells the story of the archive, and then I'll walk you around. So uh, thanks, Kate. Here's the screen share. Let's see if we can accomplish this. There we go. Everybody got this? Yep. And I'll kind of yes. let you look at what I'm looking at. It's, it's easier that way. Um, First of all, you might all want to know the website, livingjazzarchives.org, so you can go on and shop around and look at all the collections. If you are a musician, uh, you will be amazed at the list that shows, you know, every uh, piece of memorabilia and piece of music that you're going to see tonight, and about uh, 100,000 that you're not, uh, is all cataloged and it's on that list. Uh, what we cannot do, as the musicians know, what we cannot do is put that music and audio up online. That's how one gets sued for copyright infringement. So um, some of it is available if somebody's working on a project like uh, 
We just had a group of musicians at the Oslo Jazz Festival in Norway um, earlier this year do a Mike Brecker tribute. And they came and they wanted a group of uh, arrangements and original parts. And I went to the family, got permission, and over they went, digitally speaking. So we do that all the time. So uh, let me just sort of proceed through. The Thad Jones archive was the beginning of this whole uh, affair. You know, no university ever says, uh, hey, I got an idea. We can really make a lot of money. Let's start a jazz archive. You know, it's a great way to, to not make money. Uh, that's not what we're in this for. We're in this for the music and to protect all of this priceless material. And uh, Thad Jones, and uh, there are a couple of people who were alumni during that time. John, I saw you here. Thank you for coming and other people from that period. Thad was our original jazz studies director. Uh, next year, this jazz program celebrates, believe it or not, its 50th anniversary. We were one of the first five jazz programs in the nation. And uh, Thad, as I said, was our initial director, founding director, if you will. And uh, when the summer before, the spring before he retired, he got an honorary degree, and that's Thad uh, playing his commencement address. He didn't tell anybody that he had a uh, cornet underneath his graduation gown, and so he played the address instead of speaking it. Was it recorded? No. So there's no, as far as I know, there's no uh, memory of that other than this photo. But uh, the way this began is Thad Jones, while he was the director here during that period and for 10 years before that, co-led the Thad Jones Mel Lewis Jazz Orchestra, which was historic really, because uh, it started in 1966 and it was interracial. So if you do that math, you know, back in 1966, <clears throat> the entertainment industry did not think that our viewing public would accept blacks and whites playing together on TV. And Thad went against that. And he left the Count Basie Orchestra and his co-leader, Mel Lewis, who, a drummer who was white, left, had left the Stan Kenton Orchestra and they formed this mixed band together. And when Thad got the job at William Patterson, he uh, brought some of those orchestra members onto the faculty. And that connection between us and that big band has never been broken. We still have uh, members of the Van, what's now called the Vanguard Jazz Orchestra still teaching here. John Mosca, Rich Perry, Jim McNeely is very involved. And so they came to me, now it's, over, it's almost 20 years ago now, 18 years ago, and they said, we have a problem, William Patterson's the solution to it. I like the sound of that right away. And they said, the problem we have is that when we play at the Village Vanguard every Monday night, we're still using the same sheets of paper that Thad Jones passed out in 1966, and it's turning to sawdust. And Literally, it's got big gaping holes in it and it's falling apart. And we want to get new copies and we want the original copies to be housed at William Patterson. So in, in some ways, the archive started then, but it wasn't in this space. The uh, materials were stored in an archival room in the library for the first few years. And uh, so that's how it all began. And uh, let, let's just kind of look at a couple of Thad pictures. This is Thad teaching in room 103 Shea, which uh, I'm amazed to say only recently was renovated, maybe five or six years ago. And uh, this is, a, I think, in 1973. And uh, you can't see the details, but it's kind of funny. Everybody's, everybody's got their cigarettes on the corner of the music stand. You know, it was a different world. And... Uh, this is Thad's and Mel's uh, first publicity photo in 1966. I'm not sure whose idea the tuxes were, but uh, nonetheless, it's a historic picture just to see that in 1966. That didn't happen in American entertainment or American music very often. It had, there were isolated incidences, but this was a really high profile band. 
This you'll see is kind of the condition. This is actually one of the pieces that's in fairly good shape. The stuff that's worse than this. This is the original baritone sax part from Thad Jones famous composition, Us. And you can see how over on the right hand side, it's all frayed. This is completely falling apart. And these, uh, this style of paper is known as an ozolid and it's O-Z-A-L-I-D, there'll be a quiz after this presentation. And um, there, it's the predecessor to Xerox copies. And the, the music was copied by ink on onion skin and then projected onto this paper. So that you can see the edges of the paper, it's light sensitive. So the edges that are exposed to the more light turn yellow. So all of this stuff is in acid-free boxes and then an acid-free folder inside that, and then interleafed with acid-free sheets of paper, trying to kind of put these parts in suspended animation, because the idea is that this has got to look like this in 75 years and not degrade any further. This space and the actual living jazz archives were actually the brainchild of Clark Terry. Clark came to us after we had been storing this Thad Jones music in the library, and he dropped a bombshell on us and said, I want my archive to be here. And I remember standing in the back of the recital hall in Shea next to uh, Steve Marconi, our now retired colleague. And I remember looking at him saying, I think our lives just changed. And I had no idea how right I was because now Clark, you were talking about horns, the entire big band library, awards, letters, materials, you know, van loads of stuff. So we went to the then president, Arnie Spirit, and I held my breath and said, you know, we need a space. And I knew that if he said no, I would just uh, step in front of the next New Jersey transit bus that came down Pompton Road. But I knew that saying no was better than messing with Clark Terry. I didn't want to say, sure, Clark, we'll take your archive. And then it was in a bunch of cardboard boxes in a closet. I wanted to make sure that we really did it justice. And uh, we have, this is an amazing space. And the beauty of this space, particularly in today's economy and the whole budget situation is that it's fully funded by donations by external donors, not only who donated the archives, but also financial donors, alumni, et cetera. So, uh, you know, it, it's outside the university budget, which is the, the true secret to longevity at any state university is to not be a budget item. So um, we are very pleased that this uh, archive continues and you can look at some of the elements. Here's a photo we have Clark Terry with the Count Basie Orchestra and the Strand Theater. My God, I wish we had performance spaces like that in New York. You know, this is the 19, late 40s Basie band and then Clark was with the small group as well. This is Clark in the middle of the back row. Whoops, now I've messed my whole PowerPoint up, tried to highlight him. Anyway, that's a rehearsal with the Duke Ellington Orchestra. See Duke trying to, uh, correct a trombone part the, the, you know, Clark's membership with the Duke Ellington Orchestra and his membership with the Count Basie Orchestra actually make him almost really unique in jazz. Nobody was in those bands for that period of time. It's kind of like for you, those of you who are non-musicians, it's like saying that you knew both Washington and Lincoln. You know, they're two of the founding fathers of this music. And Clark was a member of the NBC Tonight Show Band. For those of you who are of an appropriate age, you may have heard of Johnny Carson. He came on the show, Clark came on the show in 1960, just before Johnny did, and went till 1970 when Carson moved the show to uh, Burbank. And Clark had so much work going on in New York that he didn't make the move. They want, by the way, they wanted him to be Doc Severinsen. They wanted him to lead the band, but he passed up the gig because he had too much work in New York. Hello, what's going on? There we go. 
here is uh, an example of a number of pencil manuscripts we have. This is a perfect example of, and there are, when you take Clark's collection and Art Farmer's and Mike Brecker's and Thad Jones's and put them all together, we have thousands of pages of original pencil and ink. And uh, for our students, for publishers, for resources all over the world, you know, this is the original source. For example, we just realized mm, two or three years ago that the published versions of several of Thad Jones's famous arrangements that are probably on every high school band library in the country are wrong. They're not what Thad wrote. And so we went back to the publisher and convinced them to republish an archive edition of some of these famous arrangements. So that's an example of, of that. Continuing on, here is uh, Clark Terry's famous arrangement of Sheba. And you can see once again, here's the problem that we have. You see all this yellowing in the corner. This is light sensitivity. And you know, if I took one of these pieces of paper and left it in the sun for a day, it would turn completely black because it would react to the, to the the particles. And so we have, that's why we have to protect this. This is one of the more amazing uh, artifacts we have here. This is Clark Terry's 1960 date book. And you can see, this is just the C and D page. Duke, Duke gets a, you know, C and D, but he got a first name listing. So Duke Ellington, Miles Davis, Kenny Dorham, George Duvivier, uh, Qu uh, Richard Davis, uh, Eric Dolphy, Paul Chambers, my God. I mean, it's like a it's like a who's who of jazz in a little leather notebook so that Clark could call these people because these were the people that he associated with. So for our students and for researchers, it really brings the whole thing into focus, that these are not black and white photos in some jazz history textbook. These were real men and women who interacted in the amazing uh, jazz environment of New York City. James Williams archive. James was the director of jazz studies here after Rufus Reed retired. A number of you who were here during the uh, Rufus Reed years, Rufus hired me. So if, you ever, if any of you ever have any you know, complaints about me, call Rufus, it's his fault from 1992. This is 30 years for me here. So uh, James followed him in 2000. And sadly, right after he helped us establish the Clark Terry archive, James died of cancer that summer. So sadly, he was only the director here for four years, but he had an impact on the program much larger than that. This is James interviewing Pat Metheny. We had a lot of major figures here brought here by James, Pat, Freddie Hubbard, uh, all, all, it's, it's a long list, but it's a, a, an amazing, you know, James was a real conduit trying to bring these major figures to the students. This is one of James's famous tunes, Alter Ego. This is the uh, original pen and then the published version. You know, and this, by the way, James was a great punster. This is the, this is the uh, punchline of a joke, why? did the minister go so long on his sermon on Sunday because of his alter ego? Thank you very much. That's the joke for tonight. You can use that with your friends if you want to. Michael Brecker archive happened four years ago now. Uh, his brother Randy, who by the way was just here last Sunday for last week for a residency and now we're playing at Dizzy's Club Coca-Cola on the 22nd with Randy. Uh, Randy was really mentored by Clark Terry. And so he saw Clark's archive about two years after Mike, his younger brother had died of leukemia. I knew Mike for 30 years. We had the same saxophone teacher. So this meant a great deal to me when Randy said, I really think we need to get Mike's archive here. So that brought in not only the jazz history that Mike had played with, Herbie Hancock, Ron Carter, Dave Holland, Pat Metheny, but also James Taylor, Carly Simon, Paul Simon, Frank Zappa, 
Frank Sinatra, the thousands of records that he and Randy were on in the 70s and 80s before Mike uh, went on his solo career. So this is a self-portrait back in the 70s when he had more hair than he did in the last photo. Sorry, Mike. And uh, he was an, actually an art major in school who had an amazing eye that was about as keen as his ear was. And so we have a gigantic collection of color slides. And so this is a self-portrait that he did, which I, of course, flipped so the camera, I couldn't stand it that the camera said Nokin instead of Nikon. So I flipped the slide, but amazing pictures of Joni Mitchell. He did a huge tour with Joni and Paul Simon and Jaco Pastorius and all the people that he interacted with. This is the Brecker Brothers on stage in 1976. And uh, this was the cover of a new CD that just came out. The CD was actually a cassette that was in this room and a record company came in and said, I think we wanna put this out. We'll reach uh, an agreement with the estate and with all the people who were on it. And now it's a release CD that actually is sitting around the corner in a cassette. Speaking of cassettes, this is my dream come true and nightmare. In Mike's collection, there are 1,200 of these cassettes. In James Williams' collection, there's another 800. Jim McNeely's collection has another two or 300. And of course, these need to be dubbed in real time. It's not like a CD where you can just take the contents and go rip and you have them. If it's a, each of these is a 90 minute CD, so you, you know, we have about 4,000 cassettes times 90 minutes. So you do the math. We're trying to get a grant unsuccessfully so far, but we're trying to get a grant to put somebody in this space eight hours a day for a year. And that'll, that still won't do it, but it'll put a dent in it. And this particular box is amazing because this has the very early rehearsals. You see BB, that's the Brecker Brothers, the band that Mike and Randy had together. Uh, early recording sessions, uh, strap hanging one of their uh, tunes that it's sort of a, a workshop recording. This, this is amazing. A lot of unreleased stuff. Most of the cassettes are unreleased gigs and concerts. So extremely valuable, one of a kind. I'll, uh, as a matter of fact, a, a recent example we just are bringing in and working on the Lee Konitz archive with his family and uh, drummer George Schuler made that happen. And one of the cassettes is a recording. Uh, this will be, if you're not a musician, these names may not mean anything, but it's historic. It's Lee Konitz in the studio with Ornette Coleman and his band. And it's an un they, they actually recorded Ornette's tunes with Lee, never released. And I mean, this, if, if you just look at it financially, it's worth thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. So this is up to the estate to try to figure out. In meantime, it's locked up here. Uh, continuing on, this is uh, one of uh, the Brecker Brothers' most famous tunes, a great title, named after the pet skunk of Clark Terry's secretary. Actually, there's a Clark Terry connection to this too. This is the original ink part uh, from 1975 of some skunk funk. It's amazing that it's here. This is, and the reason it's here, of course, is because it was Mike's part. This is a tenor sax part and Mike saved it as a souvenir. So fortunately it's here and in good shape. Another thing we have, which the students find to be probably the most fascinating and important thing in the entire archive is 800 pages of practice notes and composition notes from Michael Brecker, who's one of the, I might add one of the great musical minds since John Coltrane in jazz. And so, you know, you could get a four year degree out of 50 of these pages, never mind 800. And Mike was, you can see, it's all dated. He was just very meticulous in the way he thought and practiced and projected things out. I will now pick up the pace a bit because I want to make sure and show you around the Art Farmer archive. And I want to a little shout out here to Lynn Mueller and Noel Cohen. They 
are the people who made this archive happen. And uh, whoops, I just saw a typo here before you even look at it. There we go. What typo? <laughs> um, this archive is really incredible and it connects directly to the program. And I should, let me just hit a pause button here and say, remember I said that this was Clark Terry's brainchild. How? Well, not long after he said he wanted to do this and put his archive here, I said, you know, Clark, why did you choose, why Wayne, New Jersey? What do you, I knew that the Smithsonian and the Library of Congress had been courting him for years. He's an American icon. And he said, oh, DD, all those places are for dead people. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, you know, you donate something to the Library of Congress. I'm not sure if any of you have ever been lucky enough to visit the Aero Smithsonian. You know, 99.99% .99 of their stuff is stored off out of Washington in warehouses. And they have these sh trucks shuttling back and forth. And if you want to look at something there, you uh, fill out the forms 30 days ahead. You go down, you make an appointment, you get a library card, you put on the white gloves and you get a couple hours. Then they take the box back. And Clark said, I don't want to do that. He said, my legacy is as much about teaching as it is playing. And he said, we wanted to find some place that would take the same archival care of this material as the Smithsonian. That's been my job and my challenge. But he said, I want a copy of that music on the music stands. I want these young students to be playing my charts. I want them to be passing my horns down the trumpet section. I want my music to be part of this curriculum. And I realized at that moment that Clark, being the genius that he was and always will be, kind of redefined the word archive. Because I had always thought of an archive as being, you know, we have our white lab coats on and we have the, you know, examining table here and we look at the artifacts. But it's much more than that. You know, the students are constantly coming using this audio you know, like when we played with Randy Brecker, three of the pieces we're playing are coming directly from this collection here. Because, you know, Mike and Randy Brecker's careers are intertwined, you know. So last spring, we had an Art Farmer dedication ceremony. And we put together, thank you again very much, Lynn, we put together Art's own band. The, the same guys who were touring with art, we got out the original part books that those guys had been taking on tour. And our own trumpet teacher, Jeremy Pelt, one of the really great trumpeters in the world, played arts, parts, arts, parts. And uh, we staged that concert in connection with the archive. And when you were at Shea Auditorium, you would come through and there was a display case of artifacts. So again, it's just thanks to donors like Lynn and thanks to all and Noel's work, it's, it's just like a direct connection from this material to the classroom. Um, moving onward, Jim McNeely, you notice that we have a Jim McNeely collection. That's because Jim McNeely's feeling just fine, thank you. He's, he moved to Maine about a year, two years ago. So when he did that, Jim was, he's one of the great arrangers and influential jazz arranger composers on the planet right now and he said he had been here on the faculty a long time and he said Dave uh, you got room for some scores and if you know those those rubber rubber made tubs he brought 38 of those over here and I had to breathe very deeply and calmly and not panic and now we've got them all cataloged and everything and uh, next door here and the students use them and it's, uh, that's part of the collection as well. Don Sebesky is another noted arranger, especially his string writing. A lot of albums with George Benson, Chet Baker, Paul Desmond. George Benson apparently is so important that he's listed twice. Yet another uh, glitch that I have to correct. Also kind of transcends jazz, vocal orchestral arrangements for Barbara Streisand, Liza Minnelli, Broadway shows. Uh, there's a revival of Kiss Me Kate in there. Uh, and I think uh, 
Dan Willis is here, who's, uh, I'll get to you in a second over there, Dan, uh, but he's played a few of these, a few recording sessions with Don, with uh, Don Sebesky. So very lucky to have all that material. Al Regney is a fantastic saxophonist. I was a member of the American Saxophone Quartet for 12 years under the leadership of Al. And uh, Al is a jazz player, a studio recording artist, but also played for 40 years with the New York Philharmonic. Any New York Philharmonic recording that has saxophone on it since Leonard Bernstein, that's Al. And so we have a huge collection of his uh, solo saxophone music, saxophone quartet music, and also uh, kind of a companion collection is the Ray Beckenstein New York Sax Quartet collection, another sort of jazz classical crossover group. And we have a huge collection of audio and again, materials there. So um, that's uh, how it goes. And then of course, as I said, so new that I haven't even filled it in on the, uh, on the, on the PowerPoint here, we have the newly added Lee Konitz collection. Uh, Cedar Walton's wife, Martha is working on, uh, on uh, donating a collection. So the momentum is uh, quite amazing, really. And I hope that helped. It maybe took a little longer than I thought, but I wanted to sort of have, especially all the musicians kind of meet the cast of uh, characters. And now I can uh, give you a little walk around the archive. Here's the daring part, you know, walking Zoom tours. I never, you know, it's always pray I don't trip over a cord or anything. So you can see this room is the main room in the archive. That uh, audio setup will take us from anything to digital. We have to use our recording studio if it's reel-to-reel uh, -reel tapes, but that'll go from cassette, LPs, uh, scans, anything. And those Macs, those two Macs have thousands upon thousands of digital audio files that we have uh, culled. All of these photos all the way around the room from all these different artists, they are from the homes and from the offices of these folks. So it's, and I kind of change them uh, constantly. We have this relatively newly added this beautiful portrait of art and uh, so many beautiful things. And every time the students come over here, it's uh, different photos. So I'm kind of changing them out all the time. So now uh, the lighting is a little bad, but at least you can see where I am. This is one of the glass uh, display cases in the archive. And for example, you can see this, this record over here is a V disc. That is um, a disc that these V disc, V as in victory were made during World War II for the troops. So they were never released publicly. And that V disc is Clark Terry's first recording. And I don't think he had heard it since 1947 when he made it. And I should have had a video when we played it for Clark, when he was about 91 at the time. The look on, of amazement on his face was really incredible. And by the way, how did we find it? We found it in a, a record store in Hamburg, Germany. You know, in other words, it had gone over there during World War II and welcome home. It just came home. It had been over there probably since after World War II. You know, so the miracle of eBay in that way. And, you know, usually these things, a lot of times they'll sell for several hundred bucks. And I think this was like a Christmas weekend. And I believe we got it for like 20 bucks. Nobody was looking. I, I do love eBay. Sometimes I hate it. But in many cases in this archive, it's been... Uh, our friend as well. So uh, we have one of Clark's famous fisherman hats, uh, mutes, and down here we have one of his, two of his uh, horns. These are CT horns that he designed with Olds, and that is a sort of a prototype trumpet. You can see it's pretty shiny. He didn't play it a lot. It was sort of one of the design horns, but that flugelhorn, we have a sort of a mini collection of uh, album covers and magazine covers with that horn on it. You know, if you go, there's a, if you want to meet Clark Terry on video, there's a thing, I'll give you a homework assignment from this session. Go to YouTube and go Clark Terry Tonight Show. 
and they have Clark back as a guest. And he walks out there in front of whatever that audience was every night, 30 million people and plays, you know, a blues like this and he's circular breathing. It's just amazing. And he's playing that instrument. So it's quite, quite incredible. And that even down lower than that, excuse me, I'm sending you over the edge here. Of, if this laptop falls on the floor and I'm disconnected, it's been a pleasure to work with all of you. But that's Miles Davis's trumpet bag that was donated to us by Miles's family. Some of you may know that Clark was Miles's trumpet teacher. And uh, this over here, I don't know, I may have to pick this up. This is Lee Konitz's alto just arrived a few weeks ago. Uh, Dan Willis, we can get into the sax geek and Jonas, we can get into the sax geek portion of our program at some other point, but it's a really rare Selmer balanced action. And the uh, family said he had six or seven altos and the family said, I said, you know, whichever of these altos you, you would like to give us, we'd be just thunderstruck if you did that. And they called back and said, well, the one we'd like you to have, even though the Smithsonian wants it, we want you to have the alto that he played on the birth of the Cool album in 1949. So that's that horn, which is really amazing. And uh, it's, it's due for a repair. Somehow between the time, around the time that Lee passed or something, it must have fallen off a sack stand. So it's a little out of commission right now. So, okay, let's uh, walking, walking this way. Uh, oh, wait, a quick stop to see the special trademark Clark Terry valve oil, Clark Terry brand valve oil, and also the valve grease, you know, and a little closer look at the horns, you can see a little medallion on the horn it says, you know, CT, they're CT horns, you got his mouthpieces, whole collection of his mouthpieces, and also, uh, by the way, just for the saxophone players in the audience, there's an extra charge for this, if I can make it happen. There you go. Whole collection of Mike Brecker's mouthpieces. Look out. He was a mouthpiece freak. So we have a lot of those wonderful mouthpieces. Continuing around. And this is, sorry, I think I just hope none of you got seasick on that transition. <laughs> this is, this is uh, the Michael Brecker archive material here all of those boxes. That's an acid-free box. Inside are stacks of folders, and each of those are, maybe I can even, now I'm, I'm starting to get cocky now, but I'll walk you over, and each of these are Mike's albums in order, because that's the way he stored the materials. So that's the way we store them. Some reeds, LPs, quite amazing it's just a huge amount of material and uh i'll i'll go back in a second dan and i want to talk about the the iwi i'll i'll get to that in a second let's pivot us around here this is another use for manhasset music stands i use them for camera stands this is right around the corner from mike's archive is the clark terry archive Again, this is his entire uh, big band book here. That's the big band library, posters, awards that are right now not up on the wall, but are sort of uh, waiting their turn. This is uh, Clark Terry's biography, which is really wonderful. And I'm very proud that I was uh, helped that get finished. They were almost done with it and couldn't quite finish it off. And I helped because at that point there were things that Clark wanted to talk to me about that he was really sick of talking to his wife about. I don't want to talk about this stuff, but he enjoyed talking to me about Count Basie and Ellington and The Tonight Show. So that's those chapters. This is the book. This is the manuscript. And you can see the difference. You can see how much got cut out. So thank God we saved all this because the computer that typed it died and they lost everything. So that's another major uh, element that's uh, in the archive. Let me go back and show you some uh, artifacts, if we can. This is uh, Clark Terry Jazz Band Front that was known as the Clark Terry Big Bad Band. This is uh, one of many thousands of manuscripts. If any of you musicians played 
the great tune uh, Groove Merchant. This is Thad Jones' pencil score to that. We have the whole score as well. We have about, now we're a little over 90 pencil scores and parts sets. And uh, this is uh, Thad Jones' high school yearbook from Pontiac, Michigan. Thaddeus Jones' cornet. There's the, the concert band. He didn't finish school. He went on the road before he could finish. Um, we have, uh, this is one of the, I, I mentioned the, the Art Farmer part books. This is one of those books. This is Art's own book that he read out of. Thank you very much, Lynn. And uh, this is a, something from the Free Jazz Festival, a great sign for the Art Farmer Quartet. This is Art's trumpet case with a photo of him actually carrying that case. And this is Clark's trumpet case, alligator. Can't exactly buy that anymore. And this is one of the most uh, fascinating elements of the archive. This is an iwi. It's an electronic wind instrument. This was uh, used to totally miraculous musical effect by Mike Brecker. You can see that it kind of looks like a homemade, almost looks like a, you know, like a power cord thing with a bunch of dots screwed into it. Well, that's basically what it is. There's only two of these in existence by the inventor, Niall Steiner and Mike. And uh, if you again, go on YouTube, I can send some links if any of you are interested. And uh, Dan Willis, are you there? Can you, um, Dan has done, Dan is one of my, I'm proud to say, Eastman uh, fellow classmates who plays uh, in Broadway shows, and he was in the Michael Brecker 15-piece quintet. played with Mike and toured with him, but he is a digital expert and has done a lot to make this iwi kind of come back to life. Dan, are you there? Uh-oh. Earth to Dan Willis. <laughs> this portion of our program may have bit the dust so maybe you'll have to take my Can word me? hey he's here can you hear me yeah i sure can oh, terrific okay uh yeah so um as dave was saying uh we've been very good friends for a very long time uh we met back at eastman uh, i had the great pleasure of playing with michael brecker and the quindac tet um shortly after uh the archive took over michael's items, uh, Dave invited me over, I think it was probably my second or third time there. And uh, he had just gotten in the Ewes and asked me if I uh, knew anything about it, which I did. And uh, we started plugging things in and miraculously they worked. So uh, the Steiner phone is fully functioning. Uh, there is uh, the last instrument that Michael performed on called the Rad Ewe, also designed by um, Niall Steiner. I had one uh, built. Uh -huh. uh, this is uh, based upon Michael's Rad design. Uh, Rad is not an acronym for anything. It's just radical. So uh, it has the side-by-side -side fingerboard, which is very interesting. Uh, this is also, uh, this is made by Johan Berglund, uh, with Niall Steiner's uh, original specs. And uh, so then one day we needed to sit down with Michael Brecker's software uh, and he had left uh, a template, which was in many ways functioning, um, but if you can imagine a building with all of the plumbing, but not the electrical connected. Um, so. Uh, with Dave's blessing, I sat down with uh, Michael's very good friend, uh, Judd Miller, who is a uh, sampler genius from LA, a studio musician, and uh, Michael's programmer, George Witte, uh, who also went on to uh, produce many of Michael's Grammy Award winning quartet albums. Uh, also a keyboard player with the uh, Brecker Brothers, the return of the Brecker brothers. Uh, I don't know if you'll be able to see this very well, but as I uh, show you my laptop, this is uh -oh. Michael's uh, original 
uh, environment. These are all instruments. Uh, and as you can see, it goes on for quite a while. And toward the bottom are the rotators. That is how Michael played the polyphonic chordal aspect of the iwi. Uh, it's been quite an adventure over the past two years, uh, working with George Witte, trying to understand how Michael did this and uh, how we could bring this into 2022. But uh, we do have something to share with all of you. And one day this will hopefully be uh, available in the archives, possibly online. I don't know how we would do that yet, but uh, we're working on it uh, with some great success. Well, thanks, Dan. And this is a perfect example of a great resource that, you know, has thank you for all you've been doing on this. It's, you know, without your help, it's just kind of one of those things that would be lost to eternity because- Absolutely, and it, the amazing thing about it is that this was a whole other side of Michael Brecker. Of course, there are some videos of Michael performing the UE, but uh, I would imagine this is what he spent his time doing on those long plane flights. Uh, those sleepless nights in uh, European hotel rooms. <laughs> um, so uh, this is truly um, the, the map of a genius, uh, the way he laid out everything, his ideas, the sounds that he uh, chose to use, uh, just orchestrational genius, um, arranging genius, um, electronic genius yeah. and it's all it's all right there in front of us <laughs> yeah so yeah this is one of one of many projects that we're uh working on here we have uh for example this project and working with the vanguard jazz orchestra working with lynn on arts materials and now we're working with a uh, couple of saxophonists who played with Lee Konitz on this horn to try to get the history of that horn straightened out, et cetera. So it's ongoing. And of course, involved with all this are also our students. You know, they're, they're here all the time and they'll just kind of come in. My favorite moments are when one of our students will be kind of, they've been here for a couple hours and they, they're ready to go out the door and then they turn around and go, you know, I, I kind of feel like maybe I've been hanging out with Mike Brecker a little bit here. You know, you can see this weird expression like, wow, this is, this is blown my mind doing this. Mike so would have Mark enjoyed Perry, it. You know? <laughs> yeah. And that, there you go. That's the living part. Yeah. You know, as I told, you know, Clark's wife, Gwen, I said, the idea is that we want to put Clark on the William Patterson faculty forever. And Brilliant. Mike who never did, of course, Mike was one of the great minds and brains of the 20th century. And he would always say, I don't know what I would teach. You know, he was humble almost to a fault there. But he loved sharing. He loved yes. sharing ideas with people and exchanging and getting ideas from people. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I, I really believe that sharing Mike's information, his, his manuscripts, uh, certainly his videos, if that would inspire someone for their music, that would really have uh, brought Mike a lot of happiness. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm convinced of that. Well, I'm wondering if we have, if anybody has any questions, if we can just uh, open this up to anybody. Uh, I would love to hear from any of our guests or uh, any of the alums. So great to see so many of you. If anybody has, any any questions that would be great kate is that okay if we do that of course yeah okay. feel free to unmute yourself or you can type it in the chat and okay i'll be sure to ask them yeah jonas i should make a note jonas is in switzerland so what time is it there man what is it actually it's uh 1 20 a.m <laughs> perfect you're just perfect. getting started you have another three hours work to do. <laughs> well, thank you. Thanks to, uh, you know, thanks to you for, for being here. And, uh, you know, if you're ever in the States, if you're ever in New York, you have to come here as an yeah, arranger. Because Jonas is a saxophonist and a writer. So you have 
multiple reasons for being in this space. All right, so we have a few questions in the chat. Um, okay. To kick it off, what kind of materials is there from Marlboro Miller? That's interesting. You know, um, we are starting our own Mulgrew Miller. Mulgrew Miller, by the way, was the jazz director after James Williams. And uh, uh, sad to say, he passed as well of a stroke in 2013. And, uh, you know, sometimes these things are, well, sometimes it's, this is a very painful thing for families and wives, especially when it happens like that. And there's no warning. And uh, so far, uh, Mulgrew's wife has al always wants to talk about it, and she's enthusiastic to do it, but I think actually loading it in a car and or van and saying, good, bye-bye, she can't do it. And so I, the last thing I want to do is push her. So, so far, uh, sad to say, there is no Mulgrew Miller archive here, but I know exactly what it's going to be. I know exactly, you know, because I remember I learned this working with Clark, you know. I said, you know, there's a couple of, you may have noticed when I was in there, there's a couple of really hip Clark Terry neckties in there, but I said, you know, Clark, you know, the socks that you were wearing with Duke Ellington, that's not really going to inspire anybody. It's about the music. So I know exactly what we need to be part of this, but right now, uh, there is no Mulgrew Miller archive still to come. I, I did. I should have mentioned his name along with that other list of amazing artists. Very good. And we have a question from Michael Russo. Mike. Hey, Dave. How are you? Hi. Great to see you. <laughs> good to see you too. Even though you're this big. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for so coming. Where on campus are the archives actually located? This is in an undisclosed location, Mike. I can't tell you. No, this is in uh, <laughs> this is in College Hall, and it's actually uh, it's about you know three minute drive from Shea. Okay. Uh, the problem with Shea is that first of all, there is no space there. No, no, there and, isn't. Uh, also, that. Um, without being any negativity toward our dear fine arts center, the air quality in that room, you know, I have pieces of notebook paper from three years ago that look worse than Thad Jones's music. Because during the <laughs> summer, it kind of becomes a swamp in there. Yeah. And it, this, this building is uh, really great in terms of the security. Okay. This used to be a financial firm and the university bought it in town. Okay, I, I know where so, it is. Uh, okay. I, for example, at five o'clock, all the doors locked and I have to push a button and get my picture taken to leave. Okay. And so there's a swipe card to get in here, et cetera. And the air quality's great here. It's a constant about 68 degrees, low humidity here, because this is also, this is the third floor. I'm in the, I'm in the inner sanctum of oh. all and this is where all the school's financial records and all the computer servers are okay so things are it's it's a great coincidence that this happened to be open but i, I mean yeah if i would say there was one drawback to the archive it's that if we were somehow attached to shea right. i wouldn't have time to do anything else the students would be here all the time and as it is they kind of have to make a date like yeah i'm coming over on thursday you okay. Know? So it's a little more, it's a little, it, it just takes forethought to access the stuff, which right. with somebody 19 years old, forethought doesn't happen all the time. <laughs> as you well know, Mike is a longtime high school educator and esteemed in this state. So glad you're here. Thank but you. Yeah. So that, that's where we are. And uh, I don't take it for granted. It's a great spot. And it's, it's, you know, it's 1100 square feet. It's a fair amount of space it's finite and uh so far there's still extra room for okay. more uh one of these days we're going to be up against a very beautiful problem but so far we're not Great. okay you know awesome. thank you Other questions gene you asked is it possible to make copies of any of the scores uh yes 
I mean, for you as an arranger, for people, a lot of, sometimes I have to check with uh, the estate, but if somebody's a professional uh, and needs it, like we just uh, gave, uh, and Mike Brecker's archive, we have uh, a lot of stuff from his uh, Klaus Ogerman cityscape record, which is legendary in terms of the writing. And uh, a couple of people approached the Ogerman estate in Germany and got permission. And so we have to go about it rather carefully but you know what we have to all be careful about us and the people who use it is to not post things you know you know if 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 a student takes some michael brecker unreleased audio and it pops up on youtube that's not good it's not good for well i mean it's good in one way because people hear it but from a from a legacy standpoint it's not good you know, so, um, ah, yeah, John Klopatowski, who was here during the Thad Jones time, and one section, John, that I did not show you, there's another kind of a corridor around there, and we have Marty and Joanne Cribben's photo collection, which is all the early years of this jazz program. So we are planning, you should know, John, and everybody, we're planning on doing sort of a coffee table photo book, like jazz at William Patterson, the first 50 years kind of thing that starts right from the beginning. That Thad Jones photo was by Joanne. And so a lot of these early photos, you know, on the jazz room, she was there every week. So we have just fantastic photos from everybody. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. So that, 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 that history is here as well. Awesome. All right, before we wrap it up, is there any last minute questions? Um, Feel free to type yeah, in the chat. Um, Michelle had just two quick ones. Have we tried for funding through National Endowment of the Arts? It's actually more National Endowment of the Humanities for this in terms of storing cultural material. We're working on that, but yeah, you're right. The, arts projects. Is there a Dizzy Gillespie collection? That's part of the mission of this archive. The problem is Dizzy Gillespie, Bill Evans, there are so many jazz giants, John Coltrane, jazz giants where there's no archive. Yeah. This stuff has kind of gone and we're trying to preserve things and make sure that it's not sitting in a box somewhere. Right. Uh, good question, Lynn. How can we help support the archives? Maureen, you want to take that one? It's a great question. If Maureen is still here. She is. She's, she's unmuting herself. I'm unmuted. You can actually uh, get in. You can contact me directly if anybody's interested in supporting the Jazz Archives. You can reach me um, at O'Connor. I can put it in the uh, chat too. O'Connor yeah, at 24 at dpchs.edu. And I'll, I'll include my phone number. I'm going to do that now. Thanks, Maureen. Yeah, because as I said, this whole thing is beautifully driven by donations, not only of materials, but also financial donations. And that's, that's, how, that's where all this came from, these glass cases, all the display cases, the box, you know, these boxes, you know, they cost like 16 bucks a piece, which you think, oh, 16 bucks, but then you multiply it times 500 and it adds up. So uh, yeah, this is very important, that support. So thanks, great uh, closing question. And Kate, thank you so much for doing this. This is of course. This great is, this fun is for everybody. And if any of our alums or, guests if you want to come and have an in-person tour i'm i'm ready my fee is low <laughs> you know i'm always mm -hmm. ready all right well thank you so much dr dempsey that was my amazing pleasure. and uh i'm sure we all learned a lot um and thank you to our alumni who, who came out tonight and joined us virtually um i hope you enjoyed the program and i encourage you to remain connected with william patterson have a great evening thank you Thanks, Thank everybody. You. Good night, everyone. Good night.